tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Karen Walters was quiet and reserved, dedicated to working with disabled children. Then she fell in love with and married Richard Sepulonis, a convicted bank robber serving a 50-year sentence. Today, Karen is a wanted fugitive, accused of helping her husband escape from prison. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania is peaceful now, but in 1863, these rolling fields saw some of the fiercest fighting of the Civil War. Many believe the spirits of those who died here still haunt the battlefield. Journey into history on a spine-tingling search for the ghosts of Gettysburg. Was it harmless recreation or a window into a dark, forbidden world? In 1994, a quiet evening of fantasy games ended in a horrible death for two young lovers. Some say the killer was motivated by the ritualistic forces of black magic and the occult. It was an unforgettable sight, a fully loaded 18-wheeler terrorizing campers and picnickers in a remote forest. By the time police arrived, the rampage was over and the truck's driver had vanished into thin air. Join me. Perhaps tonight, your call will make a difference. Perhaps you can help solve a mystery. Take Richard to be my husband. Hi, Karen. Take Richard to be my husband. For better or worse. On January 13th, 1985, after an intense eight year courtship, Karen Walters and Richard Sepulonis became husband and wife. Karen was a dedicated special education teacher. Shy and unassuming, she still lived at home with her mother and sister. It was the happiest day of Karen's young life. For Richard, it may have been something different. Perhaps nothing more than a means to an end. Richard Sepulonis was a career criminal, serving time for bank robbery and armed assault with the intent to murder. His sentence was 58 to 82 years, a long time to think about the crime that had put him behind bars. August 9, 1973. Sepulonis and two accomplices struck in Woburn, Massachusetts. Do not move! Oh, don't you move! One robber jumped over the counter. Two others had their automatic weapons on me. One in front of me, one behind me. Open the door! I can't. It's on a timer. It's wasted! Blow his head off! Open it. There's nothing the I man in do front of me it's put the timer. weapon under my chin and waited what seemed like a long time, which was probably just a second or so, and said, come on, let's get out of here. He says, if we see a cop outside, I'm gonna kill the cop, and I'm gonna come back in and kill you. The bandits made off with more than $17,000 in cash. A silent alarm brought an unmarked police unit within seconds. Everyone's fine. They've got guns. The red Mustang. The bank manager pointed the direction in which the getaway car had left the bank. I followed behind the car. Well, it's probably three, three to four car lengths behind him going down the street. I'm in pursuit of a red Mustang heading east on Cambridge. Three suspects. Extremely dangerous. Request back up. And that's when they started to fire the machine guns. I put my gun out the window and fired two warning shots in the air. At that point, the person that was hanging out the window shooting on the fashion side went back into the car 
and they pulled in in front of a car that was going in the same direction and opened fire on the driver of the car. To create a diversion, the robbers had shot and wounded a 60-year-old woman. It gave them just enough time to escape. Two months later, Richard Sepulonis was tracked down in New York City. He was convicted by a court in Massachusetts and remanded to Walpole State Prison, a maximum security facility. Despite his penchant for violence on the outside, Sepulonis became a model citizen on the inside. Over the next five years, he was good as gold, a perfect inmate. Then he met Karen Walters. At the time, Karen was attending William Patterson College in her home state of New Jersey. Walters was doing a project while she was attending college, and this project involved uh, writing to um, a prisoner in, in, uh, in Massachusetts or in a correctional system, and by chance, uh, she selected uh, Sepulonis. Um, this campaign, this letter writing campaign, uh, grew and grew, and uh, um, shortly after that, uh, she began visiting him. Karen. Richard. You're much prettier than your picture. How was the drive? Oh, it was fine. Thank you. You've never been in a prison before. Um, no, I haven't. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I just want you to be comfortable. It means a lot to me. Um, I liked your letters. I liked yours, too. Your typical inmate in, in prison, I find, takes advantage of, of people out in the community. Uh, oftentimes, they'll latch on to women who are lonely, uh, want some attention, um, and they take advantage of them. Um, and I think the women are beguiled by the, all that attention. I can only assume that his relationship with Miss Walters was being conducted in that same vein. Karen, why don't you ever ask me about the shooting? You know why I'm here. I just thought you didn't want to talk about it. I got nothing to hide. Karen, I did not shoot that innocent woman. I know you didn't. The man on the outside has a job to go to. He's got friends. He's got other commitments. But a man on the inside, um, a man who's you know either a murderer or a felon serving a long, uh, an inmate serving a long sentence, he is so focused on that woman. She feels so special and so desired and so wanted. It elevates the whole romance to a very high level. By 1980, Karen Walters was in effect leading a double life. She was teaching learning disabled children and was highly regarded by her fellow faculty members. None of them knew she was in love with a convict. Listen, would you mind if we got this shot of you up against the bars? Let's do one of the Dean Hanimated diploma. Meanwhile, Richard Sepulonis continued his winning ways. He excelled academically and became the first inmate at Walpole State Prison to earn a college degree. It's been more of an asset than a liability. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God to witness... In 1985, Karen married Sepulonis, even though he had served less than a third of his sentence. Two years later, his model behavior would pay off in a big way. Sepulonis was transferred to a minimum security facility. He was very bright and very personable. So it, it, I think it's once staff find that in an inmate, I think it's it's easy for staff to let their guard down. You know, I think you always have to be careful with an individual like that. I dreamt about you last night. Yeah, what did I do? <laughs> you didn't do anything. I mean, that's just it. It was... Sepulonis' oh. new home was literally a prison yeah. without bars. Nice Karen could now visit unsupervised almost whenever she wanted. But Wait, with this new freedom the came the ultimate memory. temptation. I want that dream. We'll be patient, and it'll happen. Not unless we make it happen. I don't know if you're ready for that. What do you mean? It would be 10 months before Karen was ready. 
The trigger was an incident where she and Sepulonis were caught allegedly having sex on the prison grounds. As a result, Karen was indefinitely barred from visiting her husband. Three weeks later, on a chilly September morning, Karen apparently drove to an isolated spot about a mile from the prison. In her pocket, $20,000 in cash, her entire life savings. At around noon, Richard Sepulonis appeared. He had simply walked away from the prison grounds. I was so worried. I didn't know what had happened. Karen Walters had made her choice. She left behind her career and her family for the life of a fugitive on the run with Richard Sepulonis. Eleven years would pass before anyone knew where Richard Sepulonis and Karen Walters were hiding. Let's go to Keeley Shea Smith to find out what happened. After a recent broadcast, a viewer in Minneapolis who had done business with the couple recognized Karen's photograph. A task force which included the local police and FBI was mobilized, and the house was staked out. On October 1st, 1996, officers observed Richard Cepelonis leave his residence and drive to a nearby convenience store. As soon as he pulled into the uh, parking lot and got out of the vehicle, uh, one of the task force members was uh, right there with him. So he jumped out, uh, drew his weapon, uh, ordered Cepelonis not to move. And at that point, other task force members got there, uh, jumped out and assisted in the arrest. Karen Walters was picked up 20 minutes later. For eight years, she and Cepelonis had completely fooled their neighbors. When I found out that they were who they were, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. My mouth fell to the floor. I never would imagine in a million years that these two people would, be, would do anything wrong. A bag of robbery paraphernalia found inside the hideout gave authorities a much different impression. The discovery of the bag with the, the face mask, the gun, the rubber gloves, uh, the large amount of, of, uh, of cash and small bills, uh, we think that perhaps he's been back in the bank robbery or, or robbery business again. Coming up, two young lovers fall victim to a vicious killer. Did their involvement with a role-playing fantasy game lead to their deaths? But first, around the Civil War battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, they say history comes alive in a most unnerving fashion. The obvious scars have healed, but 132 years ago, at the height of the Civil War, this was hell on earth. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The Confederate and Union armies, 170,000 strong, converged on this small town of 2,400, both sides dead set and determined not to yield an inch. Three days of ferocious combat left some 50,000 casualties. The creeks literally ran red with blood. Some say Gettysburg is still haunted by the ghosts of those cut down before their time. At Gettysburg, there was so much emotional energy expended in such a short period of time. From the 15-year-old kid who was scared to death that he'd never make it home, or the 40-year-old man who'd just been shot through the lungs and was dying and thinking about his family. So much emotional energy was expended at Gettysburg. You have to think that some of it must remain. Many of the ghosts have been reported by Civil War buffs known as reenactors. Dressed in period costumes, they restage the epic battle of Gettysburg blow by blow. Ray Hawk says he and a friend were taking a break from one of these mock skirmishes when they were approached by a haggard figure too realistic to be just another reenactor. I think I've seen a ghost. 
I think this guy had original equipment on, original coat. Everything to me points out that it was original. Real McCoy. He smelled, he, he smelled extremely bad of sulfur. And he really looked tired and hollow look in the face and stuff. Hard day, huh, boys? Yeah, it was. Ray says a soldier handed them each two authentic looking cartridges. When they looked up, the mysterious visitor had vanished. Where'd he go? I simply don't know where he got to. I have no clue. This is one of the four rounds that he gave myself and my friend. Live ammunition hasn't been allowed at Gettysburg for 100 years. But according to Ray Hawk, a university expert determined that the cartridges, powder and all, were genuine Civil War issue. Vintage 1863. The Battle of Gettysburg raged for three long days. Each evening, darkness brought a lull in the fighting. The moaning of the wounded and dying filled the hot, humid air. Soldiers who had survived picked their way through the battlefield, searching for missing comrades. A search that some believe continues to this day. In the summer of 1993, the 130th anniversary of the battle, a group of friends were at Gettysburg for a weekend of reenactments. One evening, they hiked along a creek called Bloody Run. Just keep your hand in mind, don't let go, you'll be okay. I was walking along with my wife, and she had stopped me about halfway up the trail. Look out! He appeared to be a man laying there, but he wasn't solid like you and I are. I mean, he was... He was more of a hazy mist. He was shivering because it looked like he was in a lot of pain. I couldn't go no further. Emotionally, I just broke down and cried. I was shaken. I had to actually have somebody come back and lead me out, out of the trail. Richard and his wife are the only ones who had seen the apparition. Soon after, Richard's brother David and a few others headed out towards an area called the Slaughter Pen. They didn't get far. Ah! Did you see that? No, no, see what? Over there! The phantom was gone, but the sounds no, of the night what? suggested there. they were still not alone. I was hearing cannon shots and drum rolls and men marching on the road. We've got to go. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. All right, all right. Sorry. It sounded like it was getting closer. So and I said to everybody, OK, let's go. It's time to go. We had a thing in Vietnam called the Thousand Yard Stare. And that's when a soldier saw too much too often. Ron Waddell talked to a member of the group the following day. And one of the young men definitely had that the next morning when I saw him. He had experienced something which went beyond the normal. The patterns that emerge tell me that something's going on out there other than just individual sightings, when two or three or four different people at different times describe seeing the same thing. Then you know that something else is going on out there, something unexplainable. The terror of Gettysburg was not limited to the battlefield. Army surgeons, deluged with the wounded, lacking medicine and proper instruments, handled most injuries with one quick treatment, amputation. Many of the men underwent amputations of limbs without any anesthetic whatsoever, except perhaps a shot of good old-fashioned army whiskey. So the Civil War Hospital then was, was uh, probably as close to a descent into hell on Earth as uh, these Civil War soldiers would, would have ever gotten to. This building, Pennsylvania Hall, served as a field hospital during the battle. Today it houses the offices of Gettysburg College, a four-year liberal arts school. But the cries of the wounded still echo here. At least that's what two school administrators reported several years ago. It was late, close to midnight. The two women were alone in the building, or so they thought. Did you press one? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Maybe somebody's in the basement. Oh my God. What is this? What's going on here? Oh. 
the stench of, of a hospital was, was all around. And as they peered out of this, of course, they began to panic. There was no place to go. Suddenly, one of the orderlies turned to them and looked at them beseechingly as if he needed help with this horrible task that he was doing, or perhaps help to get out of this uh, forced incarceration he'd been in for the last 13 decades. The two officials were so shaken by their experience that they have never granted a formal interview. That night, however, they told the whole story to a campus security officer. I would have to say that something frightened them. I can't explain it, although I don't believe in ghosts. I guess to a certain extent, I believe that they saw maybe what they said they saw, uh, only because I know them as credible people. Are such ghostly sightings the products of overheated imagination? Shadows transformed into apparitions, fireflies seen as lantern lights? Or is it possible that the spirits of soldiers who breathe their last at Gettysburg remain here, eternally in search of peace? In a moment, long-distance trucker Devin Williams was known as a dependable family man. Then he took a wild detour off the highway and mysteriously disappeared. And later, a secluded lover's lane, an unknown intruder, a brutal double murder, and a possible link to the occult. Many of the mysteries we profile are just one tantalizing clue from solution. A key eyewitness, the missing telephone number, a clear fingerprint. But in the bizarre case of a missing truck driver, absolutely nothing adds up. Clues never yield answers. They only raise more and more questions. Memorial Day weekend, 1995, Arizona's Tonto National Forest. The last thing any of the campers expected to see crashing through the woods was a 10-ton semi-truck. Linda, look at this. Kind of astonished to see a, a large truck like that on those roads, because the roads are not that passable by that large of a vehicle. Usually, most of the vehicles we have up there are four-wheel drive. The 18-wheeler thundered back and forth several times that morning. Two other campers had a frighteningly close encounter. Is he trying to do kill us or something? They said he never looked at them as if he recognized there was someone there. There was no expression on his face at all. God, this guy's coming no. like a madman. He didn't attempt to slow down or look over to see if they needed help or anything. He just kept on going. Later that day, a carload of picnickers came upon the truck, now mired in a field. They spoke with a man they believed to be the driver. Hey, how did you get in here? They made me do it. What? Man, you, can't, you can't help me. I'm, I'm just, I'll never get it out of here. I'm going to jail. And when he said whatever it was with jail as his last word, I envisioned a hostage situation, a hijacking, kidnapping, whatever, a jailbreak maybe, and someone had a gun on someone in the cab. He made no effort to keep us there, no effort to ask for help, do anything for him. Late Sunday afternoon, Deputy Dean Wells followed up a bizarre report that the 48-foot semi was marooned in the heart of the forest. When I initially got the call, it really surprised me that, you know, an 18-wheeler would go down that road. When I actually came onto the 18-wheeler, it was uh, kind of a matter of, of awe. It right? was extremely strange to me. Two King 83, I'll be 1097. The cargo, some 1,200 boxes of lettuce and strawberries, appeared intact and undisturbed. The refrigeration unit was running. The cab was locked. The man Charles Hall had spoken with earlier had vanished. 
When Deputy Wells checked the national crime computer, he found no reports of either a missing truck or driver. I did not find any indication of uh, foul play there at the scene. The inside of the cab appeared to be uh, very clean. I could not answer uh, at all why the 18-wheeler was back in there. The following afternoon, another sighting. The gentleman is, his mouth is moving. We can hear sounds, but it's like a mumble, there's nothing coherent that we can make out that he's saying. He's looking at a tree. He doesn't turn to look at us when Jack is asking him the questions. Hey, mister, can we help you? Do you have a campground close by? I got to light the grill. He has a $20 bill in his hand, and in front of him is a flat rock. We look around. We don't see anything else around that he would be grilling. Oh, there was nothing else there. Maybe he wants some help now. He just threw something at us. Uh, let's just go. I think we should leave. Let's go. Linda Yerrington and her husband were the last ones to see the confused young man. That same day, a long-distance trucker named Devin Williams turned up missing. Devin Williams was 29 years old, a husband and father of three. By all accounts, he was not the type to dump a fully loaded rig in the middle of a forest. But the eyewitnesses were positive. The young man matched photographs of Devin Williams. Finally, the mystery had a starting point. On May 23, 1995, Devin Williams had left his home in Kansas and headed west. It was a route he had taken many times. Williams delivered his load in California on schedule. He picked up new loads for the return trip and checked in as planned with his boss, okay, Tom Wilson. Call me in the morning, then. OK, thank you. Looking back, I can't see anything out of the ordinary to make me suspect anything. Everything indicated it was just a very normal trip in the time frame and that everything was going real good. Saturday evening, May 27th, Williams rolled into Kingman, Arizona. From there, he phoned headquarters for the last yeah, time. Sleep. I'm going to get back on the road. By Sunday morning, Devin Williams was off the map, barreling through the woods, miles from any highway. To this day, no one knows why. None of the theories make sense. But something happened. It was not like him to even go off the route, let alone to be that irrational. Reports that Williams was disoriented and incoherent prompted suspicions that he was on drugs. But that didn't fit Devin Williams. We'd had no drug problem with him. He had passed his drug tests and everything all along and with no problem. When you're dealing with people who are missing, you can point to something. You can say they have a, a, a long criminal history. They, they've had severe drug problems. They've had some mental illness. None of those things fit. He didn't uh, appear to be mentally ill, uh, and, and nobody that I talked to uh, said that he, that he ever had any drug problem. So I simply don't know what was wrong with him. Certainly, we, a lot of times we have people that, that want to run away from their responsibilities. They're uh, having a problem with their wife, with their kids, whatever. They, they simply want to run away. Had Devin Williams left job and family to start a new life, was it significant that Devin's briefcase was in the truck but his duffel bag and favorite audio tapes were gone. If Williams had run away, he certainly concocted an elaborate cover. His erratic behavior would have to have been an act performed for a succession of unsuspecting witnesses. Devon's wife doesn't buy it. We're going to jail. We're at the happiest point I think we had been in our marriage. We had just bought a house. We had so many plans. and. We've been arguing whether to put linoleum or carpet in the dining room. I talked to a, to a lady who, who helped him quite a bit in California when he'd pick up loads, and she told me that uh, the only time Devin ever seemed irritated is when he had to wait for his load because he was eager to get back home and get back to his family. If Devin Williams didn't run off, where was he? Foot patrols, canine search and rescue teams, and off-road vehicles returned empty-handed. Hunters and hikers in the area never reported finding so much as a bone fragment or a scrap of clothing. Some began to suggest, only half-jokingly, 
that it seemed as though Devin Williams had been abducted by a UFO, local authorities remained totally baffled. I've conducted many searches, and I have not had any instances where uh, I've conducted a search and not been able to find the person I'm looking for, uh, e either dead or alive. Nearly a year has passed since Devin Williams detoured to an unknown fate. Back home in Kansas, Devin's wife still clings to the hope that her husband will be found, a hope that dims a bit with each passing day. I've got kids that look at me, and they'll be doing fine. And then one day, though, when's he coming back? Is he coming back? So I just tell him I don't know. Now, if he ain't coming home, he's probably up with God. Next, a private detective and a respected psychic join forces with the police to investigate a brutal double murder. And I believe that takes that. <laughs> to play, you need nothing more than a set of special cards and a vivid imagination. The game involves mystical yes, creatures, magic, and fantasy, elements that some say push participants dangerously yes, close I to am. ritual violence and the occult. You know, I'm getting kind of tired. I think we should call it a night. Uh, you gotta go? Yeah, what time is it? What do you got? It's, it's like 11, isn't it? It's pretty close. But Michael Johnston and Rochelle Robinson showed no such concerns as they left just such a game one night in June of 1994. Perhaps they should have. The next day, both Michael and Rochelle were found dead, the victims of a hideous double murder. 25-year-old Michael Johnson was married, the father of two. Rochelle Robinson was 19, studying to be a teacher. Detectives soon discovered that Michael and Rochelle had been lovers. In light of the secret romance, authorities ascribe the savage murders to an explosion of jealous rage. However, a private investigator and a respected psychic disagree. They see the homicides as a work of a charismatic killer entangled in the shadowy world of the occult. A woman discovered Michael Johnston's body less than six hours after he left the card game. His throat had been cut, and he was shot once in the head at point-blank range. He was sprawled next to Rochelle's car near a popular shooting range called the Tacoma Sportsman's Club. Rochelle's body was found later that day on a remote road some five miles from where Michael had been killed. She had been stabbed repeatedly, and her throat was slashed to the bone. Rochelle's body was left partially covered by a large cardboard box Eyewitness accounts and crime scene evidence enabled authorities to piece together a possible scenario for that fatal evening. Police believe that sometime after 1 a.m., Michael and Rochelle parked her car on the quiet road near the sportsman's club. They were alone for a while. They were forced to dress hastily. Uh, Rochelle Robinson had Michael Johnson's T-shirt on inside out when her body was found. And uh, they were removed uh, from her vehicle, probably at gunpoint. All right, look, look, I'm not moving. Forensic evidence suggests that Michael was handcuffed, then forced to kneel near the front of Rochelle's car. All right, all right, okay, all right. Come on, man, don't do this, come on. You don't need to do this, no, no, please. Law enforcement believes that Michael Johnson was a passive victim. The real target uh, was Rochelle Robinson. There were several uh, straight-in type uh, knife pricks, I would call them, maybe a quarter of an inch deep and a quarter inch wide in her neck, which would indicate to me that somebody held a knife to her throat to uh, force her to accompany him. 
Detective Reinecke concluded that the killer drove Rochelle to the isolated road some five miles away. We believe this was a crime of passion because of the brutal way in which Rochelle was murdered. Never see that. You just killed Michael. What did I just do for you? You just killed Michael. I did it for you. I did it for you. No, don't hurt me. Uh, investigators believe that uh, the perpetrator of this crime is a person that knew Rochelle well and probably wanted to have a uh, boyfriend girlfriend relationship with her or was an ex boyfriend of hers. Rochelle felt that she was being stalked by a guy that came into her work approximately three or four months before they found her. Um, she felt that, she, that he'd followed her home several times, that he'd come to work and just stared at her until she left work. This sketch of the stalker is based on eyewitness descriptions. However, his identity and any connection he may have to the case remain unknown. After a year, the official investigation began to wind down. To keep the inquiry alive, Michael Johnson's wife, Janet, hired a private investigator, Jim Wright. Now, Janet, uh, as part of this investigation, I'm going to have to ask you some uncomfortable questions. Uh, Jim Wright played it by the book. First, he had to clear the victim's family members, starting with Janet Johnston. What type of an insurance policy did you have on Michael, and how much was that for? We had a life insurance policy on, on Michael, and we had one on myself as well. Both of them were $250,000. We both had uh, very large life insurance policies on each other, and that was my, at my insistence, because I was felt if something happened to me, I wanted to make sure that Mike had the financial stability so that he wouldn't have to work, so that he could take care of the kids. Were you ever aware of any uh, extramarital relationships that Michael's had? He and Rochelle were seeing each other. I don't know how long it had been going on. I don't know if they were going to stop soon or if he was going to leave me or what I, do, I don't we don't know any of that and typically in based on a polygraph test the police had already cleared Janet Johnston victims Jim Wright has found no concrete evidence that might implicate her so uh, there was nothing that we were able to uncover from either Mike or Rochelle's side uh, initially that ever indicated that she was a suspect but Jim Wright did uncover a secret side to Michael Johnston, a world of role-playing, fantasy games, black magic, and the occult. Wright now believes that this passion put Michael and Rochelle on a collision course with their killer. Michael had a very extensive collection of material relating to the occult. Because of the, the, the nature of this crime, we believe that people who were involved in uh, possible occult-type activities uh, could be the kind of people that would commit this type of a murder. But more than a year had passed since the murders. Every which way he turned, Jim Wright found the trail stone cold. Clearly, this was an investigation that demanded an unorthodox approach. Wright turned to Nancy Meyer, a respected psychic who has assisted police on more than 300 homicides. It was very hard on Jim because I said, you will not tell me anything because it has no validity if you tell me things ahead of time. I don't want someone else's theories because to me, if you're going to work psychically and do it purely, you should not pre-read. You should go out there and work it cold. Without revealing his destination, Jim Wright took Nancy Meyer to the road near the sportsman's club where Michael Johnson had been murdered. I can feel Michael here. I can feel his pain. I can feel the fear. I can feel him pleading. Don't do this. Come on. You don't need to do this. No, no, please. I can also get images of what's just happened to Rochelle, so I feel he must have died second, because I can feel that the awful images in his mind of what Rochelle has gone through. <laughs> I would not be able to agree with a theory that would have Michael as an innocent, you know, bystander, not the object of this killing. To me, from what I can sense, it's the other way around. 
Michael was the actual object. Indeed, Meyer believes that Michael and the killer knew each other from their involvement in black magic. As Nancy Meyer sees the crime, Michael and Rochelle were parked on the isolated road. Meyer believes that the killer, a man in his late 30s and two young accomplices, crept up on the unsuspecting lovers. Come on out, Mike. I need to talk to you, man. No! Just need to talk. What? what? No. Leave no. her alone. Hey, go! What? Jimmy! Cop time. Hey, come. Let me go! Look, man. Look, guys. Stop you it! You don't need that. They seem to be accusing him of, of violating some kind of regulations relative to some kind of, it, it almost felt like a cult type of situation. According to Nancy Meyer, after the killer stabbed Rochelle, he and his accomplices drove Michael to the sportsman's club. Shut up! The older man seems to have emotional control over these kids. He seems to be able to tell them what to do. And like a bunch of foolish puppets, they do it. Get the feeling of a, of a beautiful... Meyer says that her crime scene impressions were so vivid that she was able to envision the three assailants. An artist sketched Meyer's impressions. This is the killer as he appeared to Nancy Meyer. She feels that he teaches at a local college or university and probably has killed before. These are the two accomplices, both in their early to mid-twenties. According to Meyer, they are now in danger of being murdered themselves. In addition, Meyer envisioned this stylized dragon wing medallion. She feels that the symbol comes from the occult world that links Michael and the assailants. The authorities, however, are unmoved by Nancy's visions or theories that the double murder is linked to the occult. They remain convinced that the killer will be found among Rochelle Robbins' friends or acquaintances. Meanwhile, Rochelle and Michael's families must wait for resolution. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. You just keep going around and around and around. It's, it's almost like a merry-go-round. And some days you just want to say, let me off. I can't take it. And you can't. You'll never, never get off of it. I know these people, whoever did it, they're going to pay either in this life or the next, and I have complete faith that that's going to take place. Authorities believe the solution to this brutal crime may lie with one of its more mundane clues, a cardboard box a killer placed on Rochelle's body. Originally, the box held large sheets of high-grade paper used only by professional printers. Forensic tests have convinced investigators that the carton was brought to the site by the killer. Further evidence suggests that for several years, the box may have been in the killer's home or vehicle. Perhaps someone watching tonight saw it there. No one will ever forget the terrible devastation and loss of life resulting from the Oklahoma City bombing last year. Where the federal building once stood, only this vacant lot remains a somber monument to the tragedy. But while the rubble has been cleared away, the painful legacy of that day lives on. Next week, we'll be in Oklahoma City for a poignant and very special profile. One of the survivors of the bombing needs your help to find the two unknown heroes who saved his life. Also, a surprising report on the controversial case of White House Deputy Counsel Vince Foster. Authorities say he took his own life some handwriting experts claim Foster's suicide note was faked. Join me next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.